Hello, so yeah, as Vince said, uh, my name's Alex. Um, I'm going to be talking about how using Python you can sort of supercharge your animation ability. Um, so I suppose I should start off with, well, what's animation? And to be all technical about it, uh, you draw a bunch of still images and you play them back really fast and then it looks like something is moving. Um, simplest example, the little flip book. Um, I remember as a kid, I think I had one of fish that like jumped in and out of a pond as you flicked through it. Um, if anyone's ever watched Wallace and Gromit, then that's probably one of the more recognizable um, stop motion animations made, you know, little bits of clay taking pictures. Um, then you get to Toy Story, which is 3D animation, which is the sort of animation I'm going to be talking about today. Um, but it all started with what was called traditional animation, which was your Snow White, your Cinderella, all the classic Disney films. So how was it done? Well, you had sort of like a lead animator and they would, so here's a bouncing ball and they would draw key positions through the animation that they wanted the characters to hit. And then your sort of more junior, junior animation, can't speak, your more junior animators um, would draw what was called the in-betweeners, which was just the frames going from like this one to this one to this one. So, Blender. Blender is a pretty amazing open source project. It can do many, many things, one of which is uh, 3D animation. And I'm just going to quickly whiz through. So here's your scene. You can pan round. At the moment, I've got a nice cube. Um, how about we get ourselves a car? Um, we're not going to bother with wheels since it's, you know, 2016. And we all know cars can fly. So I don't know. Drop that down and we got some sort of van that will fly. So how would I go about animating it? Well, I don't know if you can see, but here at the bottom, we got the timeline. So at the moment, we're all the way at the start, frame zero. And I can tell Blender, I want you to record a keyframe. So just like we had with the bouncing ball, I want that car to be in this point at this time. I then drag the slider somewhere else. I move the car somewhere else. And then I tell Blender, hey, remember that position as well. So now when I go back and I play the animation, that car will vroom, 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 vroom across to the other side. And so, of course, you can't, you know, not just animating cars, you could animate people. Um, you would normally do that with, say, a skeleton, which I can't make. I thought you could. So, you know, I don't know, two feet. And then you're moving a foot, you're recording it. You move the other foot, you record it. Little bit, little bit, little bit going to take a bit of time. So I can't do anything for your main character in the scene. You're going to have to spend time if you want him to look really good. However, I can offer you something to do with the background animation. So say your scene is taking place in a cafe, two people talking over a table, and you've got the hustle and bustle of the normal cafe stuff happening around you. Now, you can simulate this. Um, using queues. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure we've all been a queue, in a queue at some point, but you know, to be precise about it, you wait in line and then you get served by the person at the counter and then you leave. Sort of on repeat, you might go outside, you might come back later in the day, but that's the basic thing. Now, if only we had a way we could simulate this in Python. <laughs> Q, Q. Q is a Python library written by our own Geraint there, sat at the back. And it does just that. It will let you define a network and simulate it for you. So we're going to go quickly, have a quick look. So from a sort of more mathematical point of view, this is what a Q looks like. You've got your server here. You've got your Q. And then you know, P 
people go, they come back, they come back round. And you define that using what Q calls a parameters dictionary, where um, so none of the numbers match. Yes, they do. So here you've got your servers, and you define sort of how long typically it's going to take for that person there to serve you. Um, you define how quickly people are going to turn up, and of course, you know, how much room you have to queue, because of course you're not going to cram 10,000 people into the corner coffee shop. Um, so you, you define your dictionary, you create your network, and uh, we've already run the simulation. So just to look at what sort of information Q is going to give us here. So I have the 155th customer. They came in to node one. They arrived at this time. They were served at this time. They left at this time. And there was nobody waiting when they got there. And I can use all that then in Blender. See, underneath this lovely interface here, working hard, is a Python API. And you probably won't be able to read the text there at the back. But whenever I do something, that's the same as a call to the API. Um, so using this, You'll see that? Was it too far down? Do I need to move it up? Yeah? Okay. So there's two main points in this. You've got your data and you have what's known as the context. So the data is where all your objects live. See, the first one in our scene is the camera, which is off here somewhere. There will be another one where the cube is. And then you have the context. So that's how the scene is set up, what objects are in the scene, where they live, all that sort of thing. Um, so before I jump over to making stuff go, I'm going to quickly show you how I, um, So the examples I'll be showing you is um, roads. Um, there, there's a roundabout at the beginning, but then you've got a crossroads where, like, say, traffic lights would be. So here we have our amazing car. And I can create a path. I don't know if you can see it. It's this little blue line here. I can grab a node. So there we are, see, so here's now the path. I can then take our car and apply what's called a constraint to it. And I can tell it to follow the path. There we go. And then run the animation, and the car follows. We can do all that using the API. So say we have a bunch of, let's call them actors. So we have a group of objects that are going to be our cars. And the first thing we do when we add a new one is we're going to copy it. So that's all this does. Um, I look at how many we got. I then pick in the random one, copy all the data, uh, create a new object, link it in the scene, and then I hide it down beneath the floor. Um, then this setting up the constraint is really easy because each box button thing on here corresponds to one line in the API. So I click the drop down, click new follow path. That creates the box. Um, I tell it what path to attach to. I tell it to follow so it will not, you know, because if I was the car and the path's going like this, by default I'd be like 
I, you don't drive sideways, so that will get you to point in the direction you're driving. <laughs> and then I tell it which way is forward. Um, then that keyframes where I told you to remember where you are. Again, very simple. So here, I can tell you how far along the path to be. That's your offset. I set a new one at a particular time. And then that's your keyframe remembered. And then the same for your location. So you got your queue. You arrive. You wait a bit, then you leave. Pretty simple. Except we're now in the real world, not where all the maths live. You don't instantly pop into the queue. You, you know, you turn up, you walk, then you wait. And the same way you leave, you don't instantly vanish. You walk, you leave. So we've got to add in a bit extra. So I'm going to warp you in. So you will blink into existence, but not at the end of the queue. At least you'll blink into existence over here and then move up. And the same when you leave. So then taking so all this, not inside the dotted line, will be data we get back from our simulation in queue. And I just for the dotted lines, I just add on a constant offset. Um, so remember I said I hide you all the way down. I bring you back up when you warp in. I set you at the beginning of the path. Then when you arrive, I put you at the start of the queue. And again, when you're served, and then I get you to leave. So as an initial attempt, we get that. Now, you may notice the like 10 pile car up the pile up that we get as everybody leaves. Um, so at the moment, nobody is really taking any notice of anybody else, which, you know, <laughs> may be a bit of a problem. So, <laughs> come on. Okay, so people turned up. They were driving around and they left. That was working fine. It was just when they were, you know, waiting their turn to get on the roundabout that they were all inside each other. So we only really have to worry about the time between when you arrive and when you start driving. So I thought we, we get how long the queue is when you get there from queue. We know that. So why don't we? we we'll, we'll put you at the start still but we can physically move you back by some you know constant based on the length of the queue and then you know move you up to the front when we're done turns out it doesn't work that well either i mean you know people you know they're, they're not waiting that's fine um it, the problem comes when it's these guys turn I mean, at the moment, there's only two people in the queue. I would expect there'd be more by now. So, um, you know. Oh, wait. Here they all are. <laughs> Turns out, when you tell them to go all the way over there because they're waiting at the back of the queue, but they still finish at the same time, they drive really fast to get there. Um, so. Oh, not again. So sort of back to the drawing board. <sighs> I know what happens to everybody else as well. I don't know just what happens to you. So I can build a list of the people in front of you when you get there. I can still put you all the way at the back. But then when the other people move up, I can move you up one. So that's what we do. We still put you all the way at the back, but then when this guy moves up, I move you up one. And then when this guy moves, I move you up again until you get your turn. 
which nearly works. But I mean, they're there, but they're not in a bit of a hurt, you know, they're not. And uh, they're, they're rearranging each other, you know, go on, get on, get on, get on. And, you, you know, when, when it sort of thins out a bit and you've got, uh, you know, people are just being served like that, it, it sort of works a bit better. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they don't wait for you to get clear, they, they, they go. But we had the right idea. We had the right idea. So I still move you up when people get served. But on the first go, I leave you where you are. And then when the second guy moves, I move you up one. And then all of a sudden, it falls into place. You're all just sat there waiting patiently. You can see him pulling up in the background. And then eventually the lights will change. There we go. We go into green. They waited and off they go. So that's what I have so far. Bit of a proof of concept. Many, many, many things to do. Currently, I've been running the simulation outside of Blender and then pulling in the results and working with them. Wouldn't it be good if I could define the simulation and run it all within Blender? Good to go. You, so there, there was the crossroads, but then we also had a roundabout earlier. Wouldn't it be good if we could hook up the roundabout to the crossroads? and then the crossroads to some other sort of junction, and you build up a bigger network. But then, remember at the beginning, I talked about the cafe. I chose cars because once they move, it looks like they're moving. But of course, people don't, you know, sort of glide to the front of the queue. They, you know, they move, they move their arms. So you can sort of create an animation, save it, and then apply it to a model, as long as that model has a similar structure. It's that sort of thing as well. So then you have actually, um, you know, real action happening. And just a few things to wrap up. I have this book. I haven't worked through it all, but from what I can see and from what I've heard, this is like the Bible if you want to get into animation. I see it recommended everywhere. Um, there's a link to the slides on the first page. I tweeted them out earlier. I can make sure, you know, so all these links you can get. A few links to information about Blender. Um, and then, not forgetting Q, uh, you know, documentation. And there's a talk, PyCon this year, given by Geraint himself. To talking you through, you know, more features of the library. Um, any questions? Does anyone have any questions for us? Yes. Um, so the actual traffic lights going from red to green, that was me. Um, as for people stopping and waiting, um, in queue there's a feature, uh, schedules I think they're called. So at, um, you know, at a counter where you get served, I can say there is someone there between the times of you know, two and five in the afternoon, and then there's nobody. So people just wait there. And then in the other direction, I say between you know, 10 past five and seven, there's somebody there, so then they go and then, you know, swapping it through like that. Can you go back to the slide, please, about the crossroads, the first crossroads where you said it went wrong? The very wrong yeah. one, yeah. And you said this was because 
we'd added some values at the beginning at the end without adjusting some other values and so they had to suddenly flush across. Okay. So all through this you've been talking about putting Q and this mathematical stuff at the service of animation so it will help you build up animation. But what occurred to me was that I could, I could spend half a day looking at the numbers that you had and not see anything wrong. But the moment you see this visualization of it, you see that something's wrong. And that suggests to me that maybe there's a, this is a very powerful way of visualizing data, actually putting the animation in the service of the queuing theory rather than the other way around. So that for human beings who recognize what's wrong when they see something like that very quickly, but don't recognize things as wrong when they stare at a table of numbers, for example, you could have a very powerful tool here for applying queuing theory to all the problems that it tries to solve, for example, in you know uh, things like hospitals or triaging systems or uh, allocations of finite resources. And, uh, have you thought about putting it that way? Um, not particularly. I'm not a queuing theorist, or however you put it. I Guy Ryan gave a talk at uh, PyCon about it, and it sort of, oh, I could use this for this direction. I didn't think about the other direction. So when you saw that this was wrong, did you see that it was wrong when you finally did the uh, rendering of it, or did you see that it was wrong before that when you looked at the numbers? Not when I looked at the numbers, no. So it took, it took you to get until that point to do it? Yeah. So this is actually a fantastic debugging tool you just created, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> 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 no, it's all right. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> no, I won't do that. <laughs> Yeah, so the service is the going from here at this stop line through to the other side of the junction. So that's why we're seeing some cars go across faster than other cars. Yeah. Yeah, so as I said, everything, all the buttons and everything, they call the API. But then all the buttons themselves sorry, this is all gone a bit weird. Anyway, so all these buttons is just Python. I could, in theory, when the display works, I could right-click on this and go, show me the source code for this. It'll open it up in a text editor that's built into Blender, and I can go, T -t 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 and then add you know, another box underneath. The, the only f sort of stumbling block is that Blender comes with its own internal um, Python distribution, which is great if, like, you know, in an animator you don't care about Python and everything, but then that means getting external packages in is a little bit iffy. Because um, I can, you know, create an add-on. There's an add-on. Um, I could open up a toolbar, go through a list of add-ons that people have created and include them. 
but they want you to be their own self-contained rather than pulling in extra libraries. So, you know, I'd have to come to some agreement that, yes, I could distribute it with, you know, the, uh, the code I wrote as well. But yes, in, in theory, perfectly fine. No. <laughs> Great. Let's uh, let's thank Alex one 